Well, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Luigi Benedicenti. I am uh, the Associate Vice President uh, Academic uh, at the University of Regina, and uh, I am here to MC this forum. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this forum. It's the third one in a continuing series on the Academic Program Review. You will remember the ones we had in April, and we will have more. Please continue to check the APR updates page to find out about them. I'd like to remind you that this forum is video recorded. It will be made available soon and the PowerPoint from uh, today's presentation will also be posted. We will put uh, an update on this at the APR updates webpage and the links for both. Individuals who are speaking at the microphone will actually not be within the video because the video is focused on the front stage. As a result, if you do not wish to be identified, you do not need to use your name and introduce your name when raising questions. Now, just uh, as a bit of a backgrounder and uh, a little bit of a recap, I'd just like to provide a bit of context on the Academic Program Review. The Academic Program Review implements our strategic plan, and it is linked with our overarching themes and the many strategic plan goals that uh, I'll uh, illustrate immediately now. A1, which is promote and reward the pursuit of excellence. A3, align our array of program offerings to respond to the needs and interests of current and prospective students. A4, enhance the university's distinctive programming and research profile. B4, increase our administrative efficiency and enhance productivity. In short, we want to have academic programs of high quality that raise the reputation of the University of Regina and that are sustainable. Today we're going to have a, a short presentation from the provost who is actually the person with overall responsibility for the academic program review. And then after that, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers. The forum is open until uh, 11 a.m. And uh, a little bit before that, I'll uh, start winding down the questions. Uh, just noting that you have two microphones at each side. I would like to ask you to uh, direct your questions to the microphones for the recording, please. And uh, I also want to inform you that there is a hashtag that has been developed for this forum if you want to use it in your Twitter remarks. It is U of R APR. And now I would like to call to uh, our provost to give uh, his remarks and presentation. Dr. Chase. Thank you, Luigi. Good morning, everyone. What I'd like to do is take perhaps 20 to 25 minutes to run you through just a little bit of uh, a presentation on both the APR and on budget and then reserve the, the great bulk of the time available to us this morning for discussion with you. So to get moving very quickly, Mama Wolkamacho, and we all know, I think very familiarly now, the, the name of our strategic plan adopted in 2009. As Luigi pointed out, we made a number of commitments in that strategic plan which we are now in the process of fulfilling. And one of those commitments was to review all of our academic programming with a view to serving the needs of today's and tomorrow's students, to try to align that programming to their wishes and to their needs, and to drive the institution's reputation for quality. The other thing that's in that um, strategic plan that is, I think, of considerable interest and discussion on campus right now is the commitment to the historic core of liberal arts and sciences. So just let me remind you of what the strategic plan says. It reaffirms our commitments to the value of the liberal arts and sciences. It says as follows, in partnership with our federated colleges, we will determine how a liberal education can best be conceived in light of current and future students' needs and how it can, where appropriate, be better integrated into professional and pre-professional curricula. Like nearly every Canadian university, We've seen immense changes at the University of Regina over the last decade and a half. Let me just give you a few of these indices of change. Many of them will be familiar to you, some of them perhaps not. We are now in our campus population just over 10% international students. 
that is 10% of our student body, comes from now close to 70 countries around the globe. On this campus, we are currently just above 10% self-declared First Nations and Métis students, the majority of whom are registered here at the University of Regina. It's about a 60-30, 65-35 split between the U of R and First Nations University of Canada, but it's a very substantial and growing component of our campus population. Given the demographics of the province of Saskatchewan, we can expect to see that First Nations and Métis component of our student body continue to increase. We want to do everything we can to see it continue to increase, and we need to have programming that will attract and retain and serve the needs of that population. The international students, just to come back to them a moment, tend to cluster in certain areas of programming. Uh, business is very popular, as you know. Engineering is very popular with international students. Uh, portions of science are very popular with international students, and we don't see, for example, as many international students in disciplines like social work or perhaps anthropology and some of the others. So we look at how we fit what we offer, our array of programs, to this changing array of students. A couple of other things that perhaps you're not familiar with. One of the most interesting statistics I've come across uh, in recent months is the fact that demand for online teaching on this campus, the number of registrations in our online courses offered through the Division of Flexible Learning is up 39% year over year. And the majority of those enrollments in online courses are not people out in small towns or in rural areas. They are people in Regina and indeed people right on this campus. How do we serve the needs of those people? Another, another statistic, we are second in the country in the number of single parents in our student body. Second in the country. How do we serve the needs of that population with everything from programming to configuration to delivery mechanisms to daycare, one of the things we're talking about in the new residence building that we, we hope to see go up? And how do we deal with the fact that our graduate student population has increased dramatically over the past decade and more? We're at roughly 10% of our campus enrollments now at the graduate level. How do we account for their needs? How do we serve them well? And how do we deal with all of this in the context of gradually contracting government support into the operating grant of the university and therefore an increasing reliance in our budget on tuition and fees? And I'll come back to that in a few moments. Now, if you follow the Carillon, and I see some of my colleagues from the Carillon here this morning, I took a bit of a drubbing last week on uh, enrollments as expressions of student aspirations and student hopes. So let me see if I can redeem myself and rephrase the question a little bit. The central question to us as we seek to plan and to allocate budget at the university is again, how do we respond effectively to student demand for our programs? And how do we do that strategically, recognizing that demand is not always linear, it can move in a sine wave, it can be unpredictable, and when we move resources into an academic area, particularly tenure stream resources, those are fixed for a long period. So how do we respond effectively to student demand as expressed in the enrollments that they are making, the programs in which they are enrolling? How do we react to the fact that enrollments will be increasingly critical for the financial health of this institution from this year forward? If our campus resources, that is our overall budget pool, remains essentially static, how do we develop new programs that students want? And to take a few examples of ones that either have been developed in the last decade, the last couple of years, or are in development right now, think of the police studies program in the Faculty of Arts, which came into being sometime in the last decade. Think of the public policy school, the, uh, offering the MPA, the MPP, and the PhD degrees in public policy, which came into being about five years ago, and which now enrolls 220 or 230 graduate students on the two campuses, the majority of whom are here at Regina. And what we did to start that school was take resources out of the Faculty of Arts and out of the Faculty of Business Administration, as it was in those days, to found the nucleus of that school, which is now serving a very healthy graduate uh, program. In the pipeline right now, we're looking at a new program, a master's program in health administration that has been passed by the University Senate, we're looking at programs in geology, in petroleum, in mining, and we're looking at a number of other exciting possibilities as faculties and units where the change begins seek to listen to students and say, here is how we will try best as we can to respond to the demand that you are expressing to us. What do we do then, on the flip side, 
with programs for which there is little or no demand. So let me just give you this small vignette. At Executive of Council uh, two weeks ago, on the 31st of October, we voted on a motion from Arts to delete a combined honours major in economics and geography. All right, so Executive of Council passed a motion from the Faculty of Arts to delete this combined major in economics and geography. Why? Because according to the Faculty of Arts, it had graduated no students in its existence. We also passed a motion, a joint motion, from Faculty of Arts and Faculty of Fine Arts to suspend admissions in January 2013 to the BA program in Arts and Culture. So that's the BA in Arts and Culture. Students now in that program will be able to complete that degree. They will be given until 2019, a full six years to complete the degree. But according to the motion, the joint motion from Arts and Fine Arts, supported by Luther College, which was the federated partner on that program, and I quote, the program is badly undersubscribed and it is felt by the Faculty of Arts, Fine Arts, and Luther that the resources devoted to it could be better employed supporting other programs. So there are just two recent instances of program change flowing up from the units in response to very light or no student demand and a dedication on the part of those units to drive resources to areas of higher demand. Now this is a colorful chart and I just want to spend a moment on it. Let's look at this graphic representation of our enrollments over the past two decades. I don't know if the, the legend should be visible, I think, to everyone even in the back row. And one of the things I want to say is we get into some numbers now. Nearly every one of these numbers can be looked at from five or six different lenses. One would think that we as an institution, universities generally, could count enrollments in one way. In fact, there are probably six or seven different ways to count enrollments, from head counts, which are individual people, to full load equivalent students, to CCE weighted full, equivalent stu full load equivalent students. It's a complex bit. So what I want to say to you now is I give you quite a few numbers in the slides that follow. If you see numbers that appear elsewhere to contradict these or not to be in line with them, please ask why. There's usually an explanation because of the way that enrollments are reported out, because of the way that positions, employee positions are reported out, whether they're continuing or term or sessional or part-time over the year. There are many different ways of reporting these and we need to use different ways for different reports. But in any case, here, each layer or color represents a current faculty, a faculty that is in existence and they're, li they're lined out on the right there. Roughly speaking, roughly speaking, the bottom six layers represent professional programming on this campus. But note, on top of those six layers, that portions of science, that is, all of the registrations in the pre-professional programs in the Faculty of Science, pre-medicine, pre-vet, pre-optometry, pre-this, pre-that. There are about 200 students in the Faculty of Science doing pre-professional programs. Think in the Faculty of Arts of professional programs such as police studies, such as the journalism school, such as portions of the justice studies program. The distinction between professional and, say, liberal arts and sciences is not quite as clear as some would have it to be. And I would add, too, that large portions of graduate programming, which are right up at the top of the chart, are in effect professional programming. These are training people to be uh, uh, school administrators, the Master of Education program. Many of the MSCs and PhDs and the engineers are headed out for professional careers in the field. So a large chunk of that graduate uh, teaching is in effect professional teaching in a very important sense. If over the same time span we were to cluster our programming into the areas that you see up here on the right, you can see the growth particularly in business, in the cluster that we would call applied human and health sciences, including things like kinesiology, nursing, social work, perhaps psychology, and certainly in graduate studies across campus. Now, one of the questions that's in discussion, uh, with the, certainly with the academic leadership group, which is all the department heads and the associate deans, we've talked about this with the library, and we're going out and talking to faculties as we're invited to come and talk with them over the next year, is what is the appropriate number of faculties in a university with 13,000 students, which is roughly where we're at right now. And the chart you see here is a fairly arbitrary selection. I need to caution you again that even the definition of a faculty from university to university varies quite widely. Some universities call them schools, some call them colleges, 
Some call them faculties. Sometimes it's a combination thereof. So this is a pretty rough and fairly arbitrary indication. I'd be the first to say that. But simply look, Concordia with a headcount of 35,000 students and six faculties, with an average then of about 5,800 students a faculty. Regina's current configuration is second from bottom. We work out with 10 faculties, including the graduate faculty, to have 1,300 students a faculty. Is that an effective use? And I'm not saying we know the answer. I'm putting the question out. Is that an effective use of administrative resources? Or could we reconfigure our faculty and department structure with the goal, the specific and testable goal, of driving more of our spending to frontline teaching and research support? Possible combinations at the University of Regina, given what we're seeing, given what our strengths are, and given what students are expressing to us through their enrollments, which we take as a signal of what they would like from the University of Regina, might look at the possibility of a cluster around arts and fine arts, a cluster between science and engineering, applied health and human sciences, I mentioned a moment ago, to include things like social work and nursing and kinesiology, perhaps psychology. Business and education so far would be standalone given the nature of those programs, but this is something we would like to begin discussing collegially with the units over the next year. What's the appropriate academic administrative configuration for this campus? And I'm just going to pass this over for a moment to Luigi, who's going to say some things about timelines and procedures. As you probably know, I am uh, tasked with the operationalization, so making it happen. And what that means for me is that uh, I need to find a way to take these concepts and translate them into possible actions for all of us. So what you see in this slide is uh, an attempt to start a discussion around it. By no means anything that is here is predetermined, it is open for discussion, and it is just a modest proposal that I've prepared for you. The premise towards it is that uh, program changes uh, have originated and still originate in the home units. The home units are the ones who understand their programs better and have an idea about managing them. So far, this has resulted in the items uh, for change that you have seen in the Executive Council and Senate minutes, for example, and that have been put, part of them at least, on the Academic Program Review Updates page. However, when we are talking about the clusters of uh, units that might include more than one faculty, we need to have something that bridges two or three faculties. And I would say that one possibility for this is to have a cluster task force. One per topic, one per cluster, so that uh, in the end we can discuss a wide range of configurations and come together with what is the best given our current situation and our future prospect. We need to consult, of course, internally and externally. This internal consultation, of course, includes not only our professors, faculty and staff, but also, more importantly even, the students. We need to include students just like they are included in the academic process at all stages, from the department up to executive council or uh, senate and, uh, and uh, faculty councils. And we have also forums that are devoted specifically to students that we are setting up so that we can hear that voice loud and clear. But in addition to internal consultations, we need to have external stakeholders as well because we need to understand what the future needs of this province are going to be. We usually have this during unit reviews, for example, for a single unit. I would submit to you that it is useful to have it around a cluster of configurations. So if with that premise, which by the way is just a very initial premise at the beginning, how would I see the next year to a year and a half? I think we could have consultations, extensive consultations after the formation of the task forces during the winter of 2013. 
we could then have proposals developed on the basis of these consultations in spring and summer 2013. And when we are happy with these proposals, when uh, the stakeholders are satisfied that we will be able to address the needs of our province, we can then move into the standard approval process that involves, of course, faculty councils, executive of council, senate, and the board of governors. And that would happen between the fall and winter of 2014. So how do these cluster look like? Well, you can see on the slides that uh, we're talking about uh, the same uh, clusters here that uh, we discussed uh, in a couple of slides with the addition of graduate studies and research because we actually have the need to examine what configuration serves the students best in graduate studies and research as well. So I would submit to you that uh, these are initial ideas around clusters, but they are absolutely here as a thought and not a predetermined outcome. And we will involve everybody in clarifying what these clusters would be. I now would like to ask Tom to come back to the podium. Thanks, Luigi. And again, there are all kinds of ideas floating around. It may well be that uh, one suggestion that education and nursing uh, are relatively closely together in all kinds of important disciplinary ways. Not something that would have occurred to me immediately, but this is something that's also being discussed. So just to reinforce Luigi's point, these are ideas, these are concepts. We need collegial, full collegial discussion uh, of them over the next year. Now, I want to shift gears here. This is the academic program review but inextricably, and we can't pretend otherwise, it is linked to budget. Universities across the country are facing crunches of various kinds. You've certainly heard of what's been happening in Quebec. In the Canadian jurisdictions, only Newfoundland, uh, Manitoba, and Alberta have what I would call relatively generous regimes right now of university funding. All of the other ones, particularly Ontario, BC, are struggling quite a bit. And I just want to put this in context, not to say that um, we are somehow different from the rest, but to say rather that some of the challenges that the University of Regina is facing fiscally mirror those that are being faced at other universities. And I've just there pulled out a passage from a letter that was circulated to the University of Saskatchewan community uh, a few weeks ago, and you can see it. You can see what it says. They're trying to find $44.5 million per annum in savings right now on their budget, which is somewhere north of $500 million a year, the operating budget. The University of Saskatchewan, um, with large professional programs in areas such as medicine and law and dentistry and so on, facing some real fiscal pressures. I want to, therefore, just examine for a few moments with you, before we go to question and answer, the link between academic programming and budget. And the real nexus of that link, the core of that link, is enrollments, is the students we teach. All right. There's a perception, a perception that the university budget process is opaque, that it is non-transparent, that it is a kind of black box, and that far too much is spent on administrative rather than academic activities. And I'd like to tackle some of these things head on. Just a couple of quick um, facts. We've opened up the budget making process in the past two years in ways that it has not been opened up uh, previously. So when the deans come in, to make their presentations on behalf of the 10 faculties. All of the other managers of all of the other units on campus are welcome to attend and vice versa. So every budget manager on campus hears what every, if she chooses, if she chooses, hears what every other budget manager on campus is asking for and is able to listen to the debate on how we allocate the limited resources of the university. As I think most of you know, this past year we set up a new committee of executive council, it's called AGP the Advisory Group on Planning, Evaluation and Allocation, which includes student representation, eight elected representatives of uh, executive of council elected or appointed, and uh, some people like me and Dave Button and so on. That group looks at everything and provides advice to the budget committee. There is both faculty and student representation, obviously, on the University Board of Governors, where final decisions about the university's budget are made. Can we do more? Yeah, we probably can, and we will do our best to open up 
this complex process of budget making. Some of you will have seen this before in individual talks. Here's what, in very simple terms, comes into the university. This is what it looks like as money flows into the institution. The government grant, that is tax money, for which we compete with the health system, with highways, with justice, with social services, with K-12, with everything else that the government spends its money on, is 59% of our operating budget. And if you want to round it, 60 cents out of every dollar, roughly speaking, comes from the taxpayers of Saskatchewan. Two decades ago, that figure was much higher. And gradually, over the years, together with most Canadian jurisdictions, Saskatchewan has shrunk the amount of operating support or the degree of operating support and redirected some of it, quite frankly, to things like scholarships. The Saskatchewan Advantage Scholarship Program is a redirection of some of that money directly into the hands of students, which then eventually flows back to the institution in the form of tuition. Tuition and fees is 33% of our budget, and then the rest, just very quickly, that 6% of cost recoveries are things such as the utilities charges we levy on the three federated colleges. It also includes the revenues that CCE, which is a cost recovery unit, the Centre for Continuing Education, brings into the university budget. On transfers, that's us again charging Campion and Luther for things like the use of the banner system, the FAST system, some classroom use and so on. What we charge to keep the system of the University of Regina and its three federated colleges in balance with appropriate charges out to those. Going out at the other end, 75 cents on every dollar we spend goes to the salaries and benefits of full-time base budgeted employees at the university. Everybody needs to understand this because I'm going to come up with another fact here that will complicate this. But 75 cents on every dollar the university spends goes on the salaries and benefits. And benefits are calculated slightly differently from group to group, but it's roughly 15 to 17 percent on top of the salary to pay for things like the university's pension contribution into your pension, uh, things like the dental plan, all of the other plans and benefits that the university provides to its employees as part of the employment package, about another 17 percent. We spend 2 percent of our budget on scholarships. We would argue we need to put more to be competitive into scholarship and budgets. We spend 2 percent on library acquisitions and we would argue in an ideal world we would like to do more there as well. And we spend a remarkably low 4%, even though it's very warm in this room this morning, on, uh, on utilities in this uh, growing campus. Now, I know a number of people will say, okay, why is he holding back on the 17% on other? Let me just run you through a list of that. Of that 17%, here is a breakdown. 3% goes to external relations and alumni. About 6%, I'm rounding, goes to recreation and athletics. About 1.9% goes to the operations of the library, that is non-salary costs in the library, but operations costs. We spend 0.6% of that 17 on convocation ceremonies annually. About 6% on the operations of the Information Services Division of the university. About 8.6% on building maintenance and the operations of facilities management. But of that 17% slice, nearly a third that is, 32.8% of that slice goes out to the 10 faculties in discretionary spending. And that's where we pay for people like sessional lecturers and any discretionary spending that is out there in the faculties. So fully a third of that 17% actually sits out in the faculties on top of the 75% base budgeted for salaries and benefits. Again, to try to open the black box there, and this, uh, this slide deck is going to be posted after the presentation, so you can, you can look at this at your leisure. There in summary form is a snapshot of how we're allocating resources per faculty according to enrollments and credit hours delivered. So the first column of enrollments includes both undergraduate and graduate, but does not include the federated college enrollments. This is just University of Regina budget money. So the, the budget money that is allocated to Craig as Dean of Kinesiology, to Rick as Dean of Arts, and so on, not including the federated college enrollments. The budget that goes to those faculties is in the second column, and that's base budget. And then the credit hour is currently being taught. That is in the term right now. This is what those faculties are delivering in credit hours. But even there, it's not easy to make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. And let me draw your attention just to one line. In kinesiology and health studies, you see an enrollment of 644, that is 644 students majoring in that area. 
a budget of uh, $7.88 million and credit hours of about 7300 But the kinesiology budget also requires or contains all of the money to run athletics, to run the athletic teams, to pay for the coaches, to do all of those things. So again, an apples to apples comparison on say cost per credit hour requires yet another level of detail, which again, we're happy to share with those who would like to see it. Now, and I'm trying to wrap this up quickly, this is a graph that we first saw. We did not generate this graph first. It was presented to us by our colleagues in government last year. And it very simply shows three lines. Roughly our enrollments over the past decade, which tanked quite dramatically after about 2004. Over the last three years, thanks to the hard work of a lot of people in this room, in recruitment, in the faculties, the president who's here this morning out on the Community Connection Tours, we have recovered those losses and we're now at our highest headcount enrollment ever, but just marginally above where we were in 2004. And folks, if we're to be absolutely honest, if we didn't have the new nursing program, we would be flat. All right? So the nursing is accounting for most of that growth in the last two years. So that's the bottom line. The second line is inflation, as construed by the Consumer Price Index for Saskatchewan. And the top line is the provincial grant money coming into the university. And the question we, f we regard it as a legitimate question for which we have a number of legitimate answers. The question from our funders is, given the steeply increasing amount of public money, tax money we are giving you, what's happening to enrollments? And how are you closing that gap? Or what do you need to do to improve that ratio? It's a legitimate question of those asked by those who have the responsibility for apportioning public money. And it's a question that we try very hard to answer in a principled way. Quickly now, on tuition and fees. Again, there are a tremendous number of ways of counting these things. What we try to count is the actual bottom line. So in some universities, you have an amount of tuition and then 20 to 30 percent on top of that in mandatory fees. So that what the student actually has to pay is dramatically different from the tuition that the university publishes. The university of Regina has taken steps to roll most of the old standalone fees into tuition so that we try to give a very clear, if you like, sticker price to students. And on that index, the University of Regina for first year undergraduate arts and science is 15th out of 57 Canadian English-speaking universities in tuition and mandatory fees. That is, in the amount that students who come into first-year arts need to pay. 15th out of 57. Would we like to be the least expensive? Eh, well, I'm not sure. Do we want to continue to raise tuition in an ideal world? We don't. As our costs go up, and as government support contracts in real terms, we need to look at tuition. We need to find the right balance. Now, again, to try to confront something which we'll continue to discuss with campus, there's a lot of speculation that over the years, administrative spending has ballooned to the expense of spending on academic salaries. And I don't know, oh, the numbers are fairly visible. And that top one there is academic spending. We have roughly, and that's, that's full-time academic spending, so that's salaries and benefits for the full-time academic staff. That's about 405 people out of our total employee complement. Uh, Lamont, where are you? What's our total employee complement? 1,800, 1,900, some, somewhere like that. So the f roughly 400 faculty, that's the top. Then we have the students, and we, we're doing everything we can to provide employment to our students, say at the kinesiology center, at the fitness center. You see students, international students, out working and parking control and so on as a way of trying to return some money to students and to help them with the cost of education. We have growth in APT, which we're happy to discuss. We have QP, and then we have out of scope. The university has about 120 out of scope employees, and that includes all of the executive, all of the deans, many people in human resources, many people in resource planning, all of the athletic, athletic coaches, and a number of other individuals. So that's what those categories are. They move around from year to year, but as I think you can see where the bulk of the budget of the university goes. And that's a good thing. 
Another thing too that we, we hear is that we're putting far too much into units like financial services or information services or human resources and starving the faculties. So the point between these data in front of you now is to show you that a considerable proportion of administrative spending, that is people classified as APT, are actually located out in the faculties. What are they doing out in the faculties? Are people like faculty administrators, people who are doing publicity in the faculties, people who are doing things like student advising in the faculties, people who are doing things, we had two hires last year to support the top level research work of one of our tier one Canada research chairs in the Faculty of Science. So what appears by some counts to be additional administrative spending is direct research support in one of the faculties to one of our leading researchers to help that researcher become even more successful and more inter internationally known. So again, the academic, you've heard me say this before, the academic versus administrative divide is much more complex than some people would have it and we're prepared to discuss that with you as well. And then salaries and benefits by employee group as a percentage of the total. That moves around. As you can see, there's been a slight decrease over the roughly 10-year period uh, in faculties and an increase in APT. We're happy to discuss why that is and to address any questions that you might have about that. One other small fact. Last year, we were alarmed. Uh, to learn that the, well, I won't say alarm, we were displeased to learn that um, the Tri-Council uh, bodies were not pleased with the way that we were hand handling the accounting of Tri-Council tri um, grant money, that's CIHR, SHRC, and NSERC. And what we had to do to bring ourselves back into compliance and remove the risk of losing all of our Tri-Council funding was to hire a person in financial services whose sole responsibility is to work on the proper accounting of research expenses across the university. So again, an administrative, if you like, expense directly in support, not only of the research enterprise, but of the university's bottom line. We could also adduce, of course, UR International, a comparatively small operation that now has about 15, student, 15 workers, including students, but which is responsible now for uh, fully 20% of our um, tuition revenue on campus. So I'm going to conclude there. I'm going to um, turn this back to Luigi, who will um, run the, the question and answer period. I want to say again, we will do our best to answer your, your questions. If we cannot answer them this morning because we do not have the data, uh, we will get back to you. And uh, we look forward to, in the next year, multiple discussions with you on both the unfolding of the academic program review, on the future of the institution, and on how we need to see ourselves given the fiscal realities that we, together with many Canadian universities, currently face. Very well. We're, uh, we're now going to start our question and answer session. We have two microphones at either sides uh, of uh, the room, and I would like to ask you to direct your questions to the microphone so that uh, we can also hear them, but they'll also be preserved and recorded. You are making my job very easy. Into the microphone so that something that was not addressed in this presentation was the future of the English department from what I understand we're looking at major budget cuts um, course uh, um, courses are going to be cut in half um, and quite frankly the the future of the English department is at risk and I'm just wondering why that wasn't addressed and what is actually happening Thank you for your question. Let me try to answer it um, compactly. The university has, as you've seen, 10 faculties and 25 academic departments. So to go into every department, simply we do not have the time. I was at a meeting, as I think you're probably aware, with the English department a couple of weeks ago. And what was being discussed there are some of the scenarios that we're working out at the request of government. So for example, we've been asked to develop a scenario to model our expenses over the next three years if we were to get a lift of 2% each year on the operating grant, 
if we were to get a lift of 1% or if we were to get nothing, 0% in each of the next three years. They've asked us to model those and to provide data to them. What we're doing then is transmitting that request to all of the budget managers, that's an awful phrase, but that includes all of the deans and all of the people responsible for units like HR and financial services and so on, and asking them to work through that modeling with their own faculty or unit. The English department is a department, one of the largest departments in the Faculty of Arts, and the scenario that you have outlined is a possible consequence if it were zero, 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 which speaking very fervently, we hope that that will not be the case. But as you saw in that one pie chart, that 17% of other, in terms of expenditures, is really the only place we've got to maneuver. Everything else is fixed, locked into long-term contracts, that is permanent employees, tenured employees, and so on, and that 17% of discretionary income, or discretionary spending, is basically the only place we have to maneuver. And it's out of that uh, pocket that sessional lecturers and term positions are paid for. So if we had zero, 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 and presuming that enrollments remain flat or started to decline, uh, the discussion within the Faculty of Arts has to be, how are we going to allocate our scarce resources out to the roughly 14 departments in arts, all the way from anthropology through to economics, English, French, international languages, justice studies, all of the departments in the Faculty of Arts, and that I know is a cause of great concern and a cause of very vigorous discussion uh, in the Faculty of Arts right now with the English department as one department there. Okay, so my question then would be, considering that English is such an important subject, every student in this university must take at least English 100. So why is it that the English department specifically, when it's that important, is being targeted? There must be other departments that don't have as high of enrollment or as high of a requirement within all the courses could be looked at instead. I don't, this is what I don't understand. Thank you for the question. I, I wouldn't say that the English department is being targeted in any way. Every department and every faculty on campus is being asked to go through this modeling and to explore the implications for its program. One of the things that we do need to have a discussion about, and I'll speak as a member of the English department, because that's where my academic position, my home is, and I've taught there for, for many years. We look at enrollment limits. A course that I have taught many times over the years is English 251. It has an enrollment limit of 15. When I taught that course last uh, spring, I wound up with 11 students. Even though we had overloaded it, I think we'd overloaded it several above the 15 limit, on the first day of class, there are a number of no-shows, as is usually the case, and then once they get a look at me, several more fly away. And so by the end of uh, week two, I was down to 11. So what notionally is a 15-person course often winds up being less than that. How do we try to plan better our allocation of scarce resources in the face of patterns like that? Do we need to rethink first-year English? from a model which currently sees a multiplicity of 35-person sections to another model. I don't have the answer to that. What I do know is at the end of the day, we have to find a way to make the university operate on a balanced budget. And we do need to recognize that if the pie is relatively static, roughly static, if we're going to invest new resources in some areas, they have to come from somewhere else. How we do that in terms of demand, low demand, or no demand in some cases, we are trying to work through as part of the academic program review and the issue at Executive of Council where the faculties brought forward a closure in effect and a, and a suspension of admissions is the faculty's way of saying, we believe that these resources could be better used in a high demand area. Okay, so um, what are the chances of the zero, zero, zero happening? Oh, no. I okay, do. so if it does happen, what is the future of the English department then? That would remain to be worked out in collegial consultation with all 10 faculties and then within the Faculty of Arts, the discussion at, deans, at the, uh, the Dean's Advisory Group in the Faculty of Arts. And the Dean of Arts uh, is the one who leads that process. Have there been discussions about that so far? I believe that the Dean and his management committee is discussing the future of many programs in the, in the Faculty of Arts, what we need to do to ensure they thrive, what we need to do if we need to reallocate resources. I believe those discussions are vigorously underway in the Faculty of Arts. So what you're saying then is there is a chance that the English department could actually be absolved? Sorry? Could the English department actually be 
dismantled? I, I, I do not foresee that occurring. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kent. I'm a, I'm a graduate of the University of Regina. My, my, my bachelor's is in business administration, and I'm now in the John Stram Graduate School of Public Policy. Uh, two, two schools you like to talk about often, Provost. But before I get to my question, I'd just like to, uh, uh, so I, I guess, thank you. The last time uh, this presentation was made, or a variation of this presentation was made, you had a slide in the presentation that uh, asserted quite baselessly that the University of Regina's tuition fees have increased at or below the rate of inflation for the last number of years. And after I questioned you about it, I'm glad you had the good sense to remove uh, that baseless slide from the presentation because it's just not accurate. So thank you for doing that. But uh, in terms of my question, I have, I have a number of questions, uh, but I want to give other folks a chance to ask as well. Uh, you've presented a flood of, of what is to me new information or at least uh, uh, new perspectives on how consultations might happen and I think even a new timeline or at least one that I wasn't aware of from the original that I had been looking at. So there's a lot to consider here. But my question is about uh, particularly international students and First Nations and Métis students. Uh, you mentioned uh, that we have, I think you said about 10% enrollment of international students, uh, but they account for about 20% of the tuition fees and I, and I believe it's because um, international students can sometimes pay up to three times what a domestic student is paying. And, and in, your, in your presentation of that information, you also mentioned that international students are, um, I'm, I'm not sure, the, I don't remember the language you used, but in fact, going more into business and engineering and sciences, which uh, a lot of people suspect are the, the faculties that will come out uh, looking rather well in, in, from this academic program review. And so I'm, I'm hoping that the university isn't trying to uh, target what international students are taking in order to use them as cash cows. Uh, I'd be very disappointed if that was the approach of the university. And the only reason I, that comes to my mind is that you're specifically mentioning where they're going and how much tuition fees they're paying. And I'm hoping that we're not trying to use international students as a way to increase uh, the university's revenue. So, so taking that into consideration, but I understand the need for internationalization, and I think that's a good thing. But, but you didn't mention where First Nations and Métis students are enrolled. And, and I'm wondering if you, A, have that information, but B, if they're enrolling, for instance, in, say, the Faculty of Arts and Fine Arts in Social Work, I, I would hope that significant resources are funneled into those faculties so that we can increase the proportion of First Nations and Métis uh, students on campus. Thanks, uh, thanks for those points. Let me try to address them in turn. On tuition, Kent, you and I will probably continue to argue about that and how it's counted. Uh, our understanding on the data that, that we have is that we remain quite competitive with the 57 English-speaking uh, Canadian universities. Quebec has a, has a very different system. We are deeply conscious of the fact uh, that students are working extremely hard, in many cases 20, 30, sometimes 40 hours a week, to pay the tuition and fees. We're obliged to charge and we're seeking ways to limit those increases wherever it's practical to do so. But it's, it's not easy in the current climate of, in real terms, declining government support into the, into the operating budget. The next point, are international students cash cows? No, they're not. Why are they charged a substantial tuition differential? One reason is very simply that those who have been resident in the country for years, of course, are paying income taxes help to feed spending on health and education and so on. Those coming into the country newly have not made that contribution. That's one, one reason for that. Are we recruiting students specifically into areas that we wish to grow? No, we're out. And the UR International team is doing, I think, quite a superb job out there on the road in some new markets. We're out trying to attract students to the University of Regina in areas in which we have strength and capacity. So we have a new group of Brazilian students on campus. The first of the Science Without Frontiers students are coming from Brazil now, and we anticipate that population to grow to about 40 uh, next year at the graduate level. We're looking into new markets such as Indonesia and Vietnam for international students because one of the things that we want to do that we are well represented, our student body is well represented from a diverse set of countries uh, around the world. And are they an important part of our campus community? Absolutely. There's no question about it. You've made that point yourself. 
On the questions of First Nations and Métis enrollments in individual programs, uh, we don't have good data on that right now, but uh, I would agree with you that at the moment it appears that the larger part of those enrollments outside social work and uh, one or two other areas would be principally in the Faculty of Arts. So the question then becomes, and we are doing this right now, how do we make those programs even more attractive to self-declared First Nations and Métis students? First Nations and Métis students of any kind. How do we indigenize our curricula? You remember the campaign last year to make one course with indigenous content mandatory for all students. The Faculty of Arts has responded to that by unanimously voting, I believe, uh, a selection of courses from which students in arts with substantial indigenous content. So we're looking at our curricular structures. We're looking at ways that we can better serve those students because they are going to be increasingly crucial to the University of Regina, both in terms of our operations, but in terms of our responsibilities as a publicly funded institution. Thank you, and just a quick, quick follow up about, so when, when and just because I don't know how it, how it works, when folks self-declare as First Nations or Métis, they don't, like we don't, they don't, you don't know what faculty they? I don't have that data right now. But it exists somewhere? It, it may, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we can get it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Hi, Doug from the Faculty of Engineering. Again, I want to thank you for doing these sessions. I think that in the climate, they're, they're very useful to, to have the interchange of information. At the same time, as no doubt you're already aware, I think there's a, a certain sense of trepidation about the process. It's hard to be enthusiastic about it. Yeah. I guess my question uh, it comes from a, from a somewhat different background than being at the U of R. But in other organizations where, we've, where I've seen them face this issue that, that we're facing, which ultimately is a, is a budget crunch. Uh, there are tools that are common in industry or, or even in, in government that we do not appear to have here at the university. Uh, uh, in, in my previous life, it was very common. We, we dealt with an internal audit department. And the, the function of that department, while it was looking at numbers, it was also looking at processes. Uh, it was to ensure that we had effective processes. And it was very important that that be an external body. And it wasn't a, it, well, nobody was happy to see the auditor show up. It was a good process because you had to explain your processes and you had to answer questions. And through the answering of those questions, you oftentimes became self-aware of where you had inefficiencies. In, in our process, again, I, I, I can't help but feel that it's a very defensive environment we have and that it's going to be very difficult for people to accept that ultimately we have to either not do everything we're doing now the same way, we're either going to do less things the same way, or we're going to find new ways to do the same or more, which, which again, is, I would argue, is, is a positive. But nonetheless, that, that's difficult to do with, with, with the same team in the same structure without some look. The, the other advantage, I guess I would argue, to looking at audit is that one of the other streams of finance that we can look at, of funding, is, is from the external community. In my case, industry is a big target that we have. We have to ensure that we can breach a credibility gap we have with them. If, the, if they're going to give us money, they, they have questions of how efficiently we're going to spend it. And we need some mechanism to account for that. So I guess, and again, and I, I realize this is borderline academic heresy to say we need more accounting practices or more business structure, but I, I really question whether we're going to get through this if we don't look at some changes in how we do things. Thank you for that uh, comment and implied question. Do we need to change the way we do business? Where do we need to do it? Well, business in a, in a it, it is a business. Please, please don't interpret that as dismissive. How we do our work, whether academic work, research work, accounting work, whatever it is, we need to rethink. And this struck me very forcibly at Executive Council on the, uh, on the 31st, where we spent um, a good 10 minutes discussing the minutiae of a certain kind of minor. I looked around the room and I thought, well, we're burning through a lot of resources here after it had been through six preliminary stages of collegial discussion. I would challenge us as academics to see if we can't find a better way of curricular, of managing and implementing curricular renewal and change. It is.
very, very costly the way that we do it, without removing collegial consultation, but finding efficiencies in that process, I think it would be a very important one. On the administrative side of the House, if you like, one of the decisions that we were faced with in the Budget Committee last year was, do we hire an auditor now? That is, apart from the research accounts, do we hire an auditor or do we devote those resources to the indigenization of campus? We made what we felt was a strategic decision to use that limited amount of resources to drive the indigenization agenda of campus over the, over the coming years. Do we need more um, examination of our systems and our approval systems? We do. That will be one of the functions of AGP as it's being constituted, developing out of PPC, the old PPC. AGP will also be responsible for the regular review of all non-teaching units. In fact, we've just finished developing the rota of those reviews so that units such as human resources, units such as financial services, units such as all of the non-teaching units will be reviewed in a way that mirrors the annual cycle, or the quinquennial cycle, the five-year cycle of external reviews of academic units. And that will be under the aegis of AGP with a lot of faculty uh, involvement and participation. But again, Doug, you know, your point is, how do we do this with limited resources? And how do we do this too in a way that ensures potential external stakeholders that the money they would invest in us is well spent? And your question is well taken. We will try to find ways to do that. And let me conclude with this. One of the, the recent degree proposals to come before AGP, and as it wins its way up, it will eventually be seen at Executive of Council, was for a um, petroleum engineering. What was the precise title of the degree? The master's in? It was a master's in petroleum science. And one of the premises of that program is that given that it will graduate people who will almost assuredly go immediately into well-paying jobs in industry, what is the responsibility of that industry to help us mount that program, given how they will benefit from those graduates as soon as the university trains? We're in discussion about that as part of the modeling around the, the business case uh, for that degree. So it would not be financed in a way that, say, a traditional master's degree in arts or a traditional lab science program would be financed. It would be structured very differently in tuition and in the expectation that private industry would support employees by paying a large part of that tuition because they will benefit from those graduates in a very direct and immediate way. Thank you. Um, my name is Mark Brigham. I'm from biology. Um, I would take issue with the fact that our reputation stems from the teaching programs that we mount. I think that although you've used the word a couple of times, research is missing from this whole scenario, and it is the other part of what the university is supposed to do. Um, and although you're going to hear lots and lots and lots about what's important and we need more and all that sort of stuff and understand that that's a problem, how does the research agenda uh, drive what we're trying to do, and, and where is the focus on that? Um, my job is not just to teach undergraduates. Thank you for that question. And um, in the interests of trying to keep that overview as brief as possible, obviously some things have been omitted. Mark, how does the university value and pay for research, in effect? Looked at one way, if you remember, the total faculty salary and benefits pool, roughly 40% of that money goes to support research given on equal, on you know, average, 40% of a faculty member's time is devoted to scholarly activity. So there's a very direct support. I agree with you that the university's reputation beyond the borders of the city depends largely on the profile of its researchers and the kind of research being done here, which again is one of the reasons we put that additional support into, in the case of one of your colleagues, the Faculty of Science last year, to assist that colleague with a research profile that helps bring students to this university. To take another example, the clinical psychology program is one of which we can be tremendously proud. Over the past five or six years, it has grown into a nationally reputed program that is now drawing in PhD candidates who've graduated with master's degrees from places like McGill and UBC. They come to Regina to do PhDs because of the reputation of the people teaching in that program. 
And so last year, we drove some additional resources into clinical psychology as an area that we want to grow, not so much in numbers, it's not huge in numbers, but reputationally, it's going to be increasingly important for the University of Regina. The third area I would point out at this, at this juncture that we need to look at very carefully is public policy, the public policy school. Now, it's not just us. That's not just a U of R school, it's a joint school of the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan. But that school, joint or not, stands a realistic chance from everything that we can see of achieving a truly national reputation as one of the three or best public policy schools in the country. How can we drive the resources to them necessary to achieve that state? The questions that we need to get into the mix. So again, research obviously extremely important, not only in what we put into it in salary and benefits, in support, in space, in all of the operating expenses of labs, in the support we put into the Office of Research Services, into things like accounting for research accounts, and all of those other things around health and safety, radiation, biological hazards in HR. We're trying to find ways to do this, again, in a very competitive environment for resources. But research is important. Question. Research and scholarship, I should say, so as not to limit the term. Hi. Um, I believe at the last forum, uh, Dr. Timmons mentioned uh, there was going to be an administrative external review coming up in 2012. Whole series. A whole series of units. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I've got um, a document here dated June 14th, 2010 that says there's an administrative and organizational review. Um, and it was to be, the advisory committee consists of uh, Harvey King, Kyle Addison, David Senko, uh, John Metcalf, Karen Shepard, Chris Larson, and Brian Christie. Um, so did this report, um, or did it just fall by the wayside, or what sort of happened with this? That, uh, that was actually done uh, before I got back. I'm just I'm looking around the room to see if there's anybody who actually served in that committee here who could comment on it. Um, that was, I'm sorry? President. I should add, too, um, Brian Christie might be able to give us the detail on this. You know, we're, we're very conscious of the amount of spending on administration. Every university is conscious of that because it's very much in the discussion at every Canadian university campus. And so you did some benchmarking of our administrative costs, which are defined very, very simply as non-direct teaching and non-direct research support. And we came out relatively well. It's not to say that we cannot do better but against a group of comparator institutions, Brian, we did fairly well. Thanks, Luigi. Um, Brian's just going to respond, Susan, if, if he could. Sorry. So, so Tom, we, we took the uh, financial statistics that all universities in Canada uh, report to Statistics Canada and looked at a uh, regression analysis of administrative expenses uh, versus uh, full-time equivalent students for those universities because obviously the um, universities that are very small have a very different profile and, and to those that are very large in terms of the amount of administrative resources they need to devote. There are economies of scale but there are also more complexities for the large universities and so on. So we ran that, that regression analysis. We then projected based on our FTEs the, the amount of administrative spending that uh, one would expect from that uh, set of data and then compared it to our actual expenses as reported to Statistics Canada and we fell below that by a, what, three, four percent? So, and that's been a historic uh, phenomenon that, that we spend less than you would project for the size of the institution on administrative expenses. Thank you. Which again is not to say that we cannot do better, but according to those data and those calculations, we are slightly below where we would normally track based on that comparator group. 
Now we move to the next question. I'll step back if you have nope. a follow-up. No, nope, it's not a follow-up. It's a different question. Okay. Um, Susan Johnson from the Department of English. Um, my question is actually not about the fate of the major, although I certainly appreciate the passion for the program um, that's being manifested by our students here. I'm actually more concerned about the fate of, of English 100. Um, and you mentioned that we might have to explore um, different models of delivery, and your example was from 251. And much as I hate to admit it, I'm probably in my secret heart inclined to agree with you that that's a luxury we're no longer going to be able to afford. Um, but one of the things that an analysis of first-year English classes at institutions across the country, as recently performed by the Canadian Association of Chairs of English, indicates is that while intro to lit type classes at the first year tend to balloon as high as 400, um, for the most part, unless they are accompanied by graduate student taught small seminars, Intro to comp classes, we're kind of at 35 to 40 on the higher end of that. And I think my concern is that we're not going to be, we in the English department are not going to be able to fulfill what I take to be our professional duty in teaching composition, the commitment to literacy, the amount of take home writing that that entails is laid down in the department handbook. Um, without those smaller sections. It's not clear to me, especially given the substantially small size of our graduate program, how we teach comp on a much different model. So what did you have in mind there? Do I have something clearly in mind as a new model? I do not, to be honest with you. What I'm saying, Susan, is this. If were to have extremely straightened resources, AIT resources, very little to play with over the next couple of years. We're obviously going to have to look carefully at how we do deliver curricula across the campus. If we have sections, um, average enrollments are 4 to 8 to 12, how do we sustain those? To what degree do we cross subsidize from large enrollment, lower level classes? to make possible those smaller upper year classes, which we all value in various ways. But the kind of hard truth, or if, if you like, dilemma that we need to discuss as a college, collegially, is this. If we see government support going in this direction, if we want to limit wherever possible tuition expenses, how do we deliver programs in a way that we can actually afford to deliver them? in an era in which we become increasingly dependent, as I said earlier, on enrollments, on growing enrollments, just to keep the institution sustainable. So if we've got to grow enrollments, we need to look at high demand areas. What implications does that have for areas like English, which are high demand? What implications does that have for areas that have lesser demand? And how do we, in effect, square that circle? So to return to your question, do I have a model in mind? No, I don't. I did say at the end of the meeting with, with English to the, the head of English, who I don't think is here today, Nick, if you want me to try a 75-person section of English 251 and we can figure out an efficient way to ensure that students get the marking attention they need, I'll work with you to do it. Perhaps I didn't make myself perfectly clear. I'm talking about the first-year composition program right. rather than those higher right. Uh, level courses, and I, where I do agree with you, I think that we could certainly achieve some efficiencies by raising the caps on cores, offering them less often, and as many of our students here know, that's happening already. My concern is very precisely with English 100 first year composition, particularly in an environment where, as you quite rightly note, we are um, interested in not just increasing our number of international students, but um, improving uh, the, the quality of the language and writing education that they get. It's in that environment, which is sections of 35, it concerns sections of 35 to 40, largely taught out of apparently discretional uh, spending by sessionals, right, 52 sections across the campus in most falls that I'm concerned, right, rather than senior 300 level classes with four people, 
So I just wanted to clarify that point, Tom. Thank you for that. And in, in returning to 251, I didn't mean to slight or disregard your question. That's the one I'm most familiar with. In talking to Nick about exploring different ways of thinking of 251, we need to think, too, of different ways of doing 100. Do I have a pat answer for that right here this morning? I don't. Hi. Uh, me again. Um, how much did we pay HESA to conduct the, their evaluations, uh, which you've used for the APR, and are those findings posted anywhere? I think. Or do we I have access to them? The data reports are all there. It's um, a stack of paper, probably 3,000 pages in total. So you're welcome to come and read through them. Okay. Um, where, <laughs> what did, it, what did it cost? Again, I believe it was in the region of $150,000 to have all of those data reports done in uh, back in 09-10. I think it was about 150. I stand corrected if anybody has a, a more accurate figure, but I believe it was 150. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Tom. I'm over here. <laughs> Hi. Um, I guess what I have is um, kind of a general comment with a couple specifics and then maybe you'd like to comment on it. And as I'm listening to your presentation, I'm struck by a couple things that um, I, do, I, I know that it's generally the way we've been going and I find it somewhat worrisome. I've been at the U of R for 20 years now and I have to say that um, what attracted me to come and work at the U of R as a person who's not from Saskatchewan is that I saw that we had something that I might call the U of R difference that, um, uh, you know, we actually did seem to conceptualize ourselves a little bit differently than the way that other universities seem to conceptualize themselves in the sense that, I, I, and I think that it was reflected in our motto as one who serves, but we did that in the sense that we seemed to be very serious at that time about serving what some people might call the common good or the public interest, um, we saw ourselves as following a little bit different of a mission of other universities, I think, and that over the years um, there has been a certain kind of pressure, and I know some of it is very real in terms of budgets, and I'm not dismissing that, that the way that we ought to go is to maybe follow the example of some other universities, perhaps, you know, make ourselves into a third-rate University of Toronto, something which, you know, we can never be a very, I don't believe anyway, we can never be a good University of Toronto. I think we could be a great University of Regina if we actually understood very well who we are and we tried to really follow up on those things. And to my mind, of course, what I would advocate for that is that we really take seriously this idea that what we're doing is following a certain kind of tradition to serve the public interest. Now, with that in mind, um, I, I am worried about this notion that the question of audits has come up, and I hear what is really a certain kind of technical or instrumental rationality that, is, that could be driving this process so that we really pay attention very much to the bottom line as we're deciding what it is that we're doing. How many bums do we have in seats? You know, what's the bottom line in terms of this and that? as opposed to really um, thinking about how we can cultivate a certain way of being and then measure our success in a very robust way. So you mentioned, for example, the arts and culture program and the economics and geography program, two very valuable, potentially valuable programs, but things which we created and then really didn't cultivate. We didn't cultivate the demand for them. We didn't make the case, for example, to students about why it would be important for them to do those things and why it would be important for us to have people in the world who were schooled in those kinds of things. Um, my last comment, I guess, would be on the petroleum science. This is all of a piece you can hear of what I'm saying, even though it may seem to be disparate. You talk about uh, having industry fund or at least contribute to our masters in petroleum science. And I have to say that really worries me. Um, I'm not sure uh, whether I'm a lone voice here, but given the fact that we are an, a, a university and one which is, I think, cultivating a critical voice, I have no problem with the masters in petroleum science, but I do think we want to turn out petroleum scientists who actually understand when it's important to say no 
um, when, for example, their work may be going in directions that is not healthy for the people or the planet. Thank you, uh, Joanne. That, that's a, a rich set of comments. I, I'm just going to begin uh, a response. I don't really have answers, but if I can comment back to you. Uh, when I began here as an undergraduate, I came into uh, what was then a combined program in administration and law back some years. And uh, my first year, first semester, English 100, the course to which Susan referred, I changed my life. The person who was teaching that course was incredibly good. And uh, I, I switched my major to my parents' dismay. And I went on to take a number of courses uh, in that department, including one further from that person. And this is the good old days when government support was very generous. I remember taking a course in Old English, Anglo-Saxon, with four people in it. It stretched over two terms. And this same person then went on to uh, do me a directed reading in Latin uh, in those days. I look back on that now with a sense almost of wonderment. My life was fundamentally changed by that. And what you've just articulated is how do we maintain the possibility for, for similar changes to occur in an era in which we do not have the choices and we do not have the resources that we had back in the 1980s. With regard to private support, I know it's, it's a very difficult line. But if we're proposing a program to the university community, this has to be voted on by executive of council. It has to be accepted by Senate. We would want to say, if it is true that the graduates from that program are going pretty certainly immediately out into well-paid jobs, 80,000 and above, in industry in Saskatchewan, is it reasonable to ask the industry who will immediately benefit from their skills and their input to their bottom line to give us upfront money, say, for facilities, to buy equipment, lab equipment? Or do we set tuition for that professional master's program at a level which makes it almost obligatory for the employers to contribute while very carefully guarding academic autonomy around the structure of the curricula, the content of the curricula, and who's teaching? And those are things that we will never give up. That is the core of the academic mission and academic autonomy. The university's right to set its own curricula, to set you know, its own teachers, to approve of its own teachers, and to deal with students in a framework free from outside inter interference. Part of any number of important issues. But I'm, I'm deeply conscious of what you say. I would ask you, the group as a whole, just to keep considering the problem in an era in which we become increasingly reliant on enrollments. Student demand is expressed in enrollments. How do we square that circle? It's getting more challenging. Sylvain Roux, Department of French. And my question regards um, government support. Um, government support? Government support? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I guess in, uh, when we'll get the next provincial budget, probably in March, we'll have um, a few answers. But um, um, I would like to know what is your feeling at this very moment about um, what would be um, the vision um, regarding the university? that um, the current government could have? Like, would they see um, um, what would be like the, um, um, the priority given to universities in regard to health? Or uh, is there like a certain way you think that a uh, university could change in their vision? Let me, let me try to answer that. Uh, I can't speak, obviously, for government in any way, shape, or form. I'm looking at government as an outsider, as someone who works closely with advanced education on issues of budget and universities and degree granting, but I'm, I'm not a member of the bureaucracy or of government. I'm a citizen in that regard. What I, as a citizen, would do, and what we all need to do as citizens, is to articulate to our elected representatives in a calm, a rational, and fact-based way the case for investing in higher education. I've forgotten who said this, but it is one of the great lines of all times. If you think education is expensive, consider the alternative. All right? The investment we make, particularly in post-secondary in a province like this, is one of the reasons that we had the conference board report done about six months ago, pays off enormous dividends. And I don't mean just fiscal dividends in increased income tax payments by well-educated, well-paid people, but social dividends. A better educated population is a healthier population, is basically a happier population, is basically a population that is socially more cohesive 
by and large. So we try to articulate that case when we make our request to government in the form of the operating forecast. And I would really urge, if you've not had a look at it, just go to the main web page of the university, put in a slash at the end, type ORP, which is the Office of Resource Planning, Brian's unit, and you'll see all of the success of operations forecasts and budget documents and so on. Just click through to the 2013-14 ops forecast and read it. It's 20, 30 slides in which we, tr we articulate a case for public investment into this institution, realizing that we're doing so in a competitive environment. Not just competitive within the post-secondary envelope, with our colleagues at the University of Saskatchewan needing money, SIAS needing money, the regional colleges needing money, the scholarship programs needing money, but competitive in the larger provincial spending envelope to, to which you refer, health, K-12 education, uh, social services, highways, everything else that the, uh, the government spends its money on. And if I may, again, just one further anecdote before returning to your question. One of the watershed moments of my career in the last couple of years was when I was out at the coast. Um, and we sat in a room one day, there were about 25 of us from the BC universities. And we were addressed by the BC minister, uh, Deputy Minister of Finance, Graham Whitmarsh. And he said, I'm going to put a slide up for you and I'm going to put four successive lines on this slide. Just bear with me as I do this. So the slide went up on the screen. The horizontal axis ran from 08 to 2020. So it was 08, 09, 10 actuals, and then projections out, because this was in 2010, projections out to 2020. And we all know projections out that far are shaky at best. So he said, I'm going to put these lines up now, one by one. First line went right up to the top right-hand corner. And he looked at us and he said, I think you know what that is. And we said, yes, that's health, right? And he said, yes, that's our projection for health spending in the province of BC if, if, there are no new drugs that go onto the formulary and no new, no new technologies are brought in. That simply reflects the demographics of an aging population requiring more health care and the labor costs involved in delivering that health care. So that was line one. Line two started lower and went up at a lower rate of increase. He asked what we thought that was. And we didn't know. So we said, we don't know. He said, that's uh, the cost of servicing the provincial debt not nearly anything like what they're spending on health, but a pretty substantial whack of change in a resource-rich province like BC by 2020. The third line went on. It began at midpoint and was essentially flat out to 2015 and then took a 20% downward drop into 2020. And he said, uh, with a, a finance minister sort of grin on his face, um, what do you think that is? And we said, that's post-secondary, isn't it? And uh, he said, yeah, that's our projections for post-secondary in BC, but I've got one more line. So you've got health, you've got debt servicing, you've got post-secondary going like this. The fourth line then went on, and it was zeroed right out by 2020. And he said, I know you can't guess what that is. And I wrote silent. And he finally said, that's all other government spending. Given where we're going with health, debt servicing, we could do this for you, a 20% drop in your allocation for post-secondary, if we zeroed out government spending on everything else. That was how he presented what he saw to be the reality for the next decade or so in BC. Watershed moment, and again, those projections beyond a year or two are shaky at best. In Saskatchewan right now, we're dealing with the fact that a lot of our provincial revenue comes from pretty volatile sources. What happens to potash prices? What happens to oil and gas? What happens to uranium? Directly and materially impacts the bottom line of the province of Saskatchewan and what it's able to turn back to us. Do we try to articulate the best possible evidence-based case for public investment in post-secondary? Yes, we do but we do so in a highly competitive environment. I hope that answers your question. Please read that operations forecast. If you have suggestions to us on how we might better articulate that case, we're happy to listen to them. As we are nearing the end of our session, I think that this will be the last question. No pressure there. Um, Jennifer from Kinesiology and Health Studies. Um, my, my question is actually just more of a comment. Um, I'm, I'm sensing a lot of concern um, from staff as we look at academic performance review. Um, the focus, rightedly, is, is academic based on the program structure, complement structure, et cetera. Um, but the what happens to me moment is happening a lot, and not in my faculty. I feel very lucky where I am. Um, I'm part, we're very consultative, and I'm, I'm part of that um, discussion. But I don't sense the same in other areas. So I know that there's, 
there's concern of you know voices the how the implementation part for example when we if if we decide to go into a new new structure per se drastically impacts can dra the, the the staffing um, uh, level as as opposed to who teaches what class you know and so I guess I just wanted on the radar that um, that there is the concern out there and it's more widely felt um, at the staff level and I'm wondering with those cluster task forces that were identified if um, there's a plan to include um, any you know staff as opposed to just keeping it top level academic um, so that's one question and then um, just Praising the opportunities to come out and just hear what's going on and, and, and snapshot moments like we had with the strategic plan one a couple of weeks ago, especially in this time of change, I think that's very important for there at least to, to have a, a forum for, for people to come in and, and hear what's happening but also um, ask questions and get answers. And uh, So I think this is great. Um, and I would also encourage a similar such, you know, perhaps opportunity if your know, busy schedules allow um, to perhaps meet with you know APT and QP separately perhaps from an open forum such as this they're just you may you may find the the voices heard will be different the questions raised might be different and it could just help to frame the environment thank you for that again that's a that's a rich set of comments let me try prefer, perhaps reverse order and ask Luigi to touch on the composition of the the, the task force um, we, will, we realize that we have not done enough to publicize what's going on. Uh, clearly, regular postings to the Academic Review uh, webpage are not enough. So we're going to do more of these, more town halls. If at any time, any faculty or department or non-teaching unit invites one of us to come and speak, we will make that a priority, to come and speak and discuss with them the implications. Is there fear in the system? Is there concern in the system? We know there is. And one of the questions, again, we all need to get our minds around. If somehow tomorrow we said it was a really good idea, it's academically very, very intelligent, it is financially very, very intelligent, it is in every way a great idea to bring together faculties X and Y, there's no immediate saving. In fact, there are costs up front in bringing faculties together. Everything from the possibility of physical collocation to signage to web pages to banner coding, everything else, there's a substantial upfront cost that we would not need to talk to our friends in government about if we go down that path. We would need some one-time support to achieve that. And the other thing, Jennifer, is that we want to continue, not just to maintain, but to grow our enrollments. And so in a very real sense, if our enrollments are growing modestly at 2 or 3 percent per year, the workload doesn't go away, right? All of those people who assist students to register, who advise students, who feed students, who clean the hallways, who do everything on which the teaching and research enterprise rests will still have work to do. How do we make them feel confident of that in an era of pretty strong fiscal constraint? That's the challenge. But thank you for that. Luigi, do you want to comment on the composition of the, uh, the task forces? I, I think it's a great idea. And if, if I may, APT and QP want us to come anytime, anytime. Yeah, in fact, uh, the composition of the task force is not set at this moment. So I think that uh, it's an excellent suggestion, one that uh, I think makes a lot of sense and uh, will work to have a composition that is as representative as possible because essentially what we want is the whole university to be involved in this conversation. And with that, I think that uh, we have to close the forum. First of all, thank you all very much. Your contributions are central to the future of the university, and I'm very grateful that you spent the time with us to discuss. I will give you a reminder that this PowerPoint will actually be posted on the APR side, and that the conversation continues. We have an email, uh, academic.program.review at uregina.ca, that you can continue to work on. Uh, you can uh, continue the conversation directly with us, as uh, the provost told us. Uh, uh, we will make it a priority to meet with any of the groups that require an update, and uh, this is only one of a series of conversations, public conversations and forums that we will continue to have in the future as we develop and ultimately conclude not only the academic program review, of course, but uh, our strategic plan. So 
We will also endeavor to post uh, some of the answers to the questions that are uh, of relevance to the entire university on the website uh, with permission of the people who post them. And you should uh, know as well, as I said at the very beginning, that this conversation has been recorded and will be posted as well. And with that, uh, thank you all very much, and it was a great pleasure to spend some time with all of you. Thank you.